Firstly, thank you, Sarah, for this day for inviting me along, um, and it's um, a pleasure to, uh, to talk to you all. Uh, I hope that some of the things that I will say won't be too repetitious. Um, I'm aware that you've had a number of presentations, and some of the things that I might say might be like the vision. However, um, what I do want to focus on is uh, the situation in Australia, which is, um, as many of you will know, very different from that that exists overseas. But just to give you a little bit of context of a bit more than what Mark has been able to say, um, I've been an infertility counsellor in Victoria now since um, well, that's about 20 years now, now I guess. And um, but in particular, I've been working with people seeking surrogacy since about, um, I think I saw sort of my first couple back in about 1988, so it's some time back. And I think overall now, I've probably seen an excess, certainly in excess of 100 couples that have been seeking surrogacy. <coughs> now, my experience has been with couples who have been seeking altruistic surrogacy, and um, that's been largely because the legislation in this country has been fairly restrictive. And um, although it's changed more recently, and I think very much in the right direction, it took a long time for things to change. Um, and especially in Victoria, which now has um, legislation which at least is clear, but um, it's still somewhat restrictive and um, more restrictive than some of the other states. I think one of the interesting things about the legislation changes around the country has been that Queensland went from um, having legislation which put people in jail if they undertook surrogacy to now having the most liberal legislation in the country. So I'm not quite sure what happens in Queensland, but um, some of you might have a better idea than me. Um, but anyway, um, my, my um, experience with surrogacy has been of two sorts, really. Um, uh, firstly, to provide counselling for couples who are seeking it. Um, and I differentiate that from uh, providing assessment. Uh, there's a, in the trade, I guess, in the psychological trade, there is um, there's always a distinction made between these two things that um, to be able to provide counselling and support for people who are wanting to do it is one thing. To be in a position where you're actually making an assessment and writing a report about people um, for the purposes of um, them being approved and um, uh, uh, well, approved by this state, the patient review panel, is another thing. So there's two different um, uh, emphases that I have to take from time to time. So I'll try and talk about where I, where I, what I've been able to find from both of those perspectives. Um, now you all know these definitions well enough, so I won't, I won't um, uh, bother you with too much of it, except to say that, um, that in Victoria, traditional surrogacy is out. And um, so the surrogate, surrogate can't use their own egg in the state, and uh, so what I've been doing is talking to people who've been wanting to use um, the, uh, an egg of another person or an embryo of their own um, uh, uh, for me. Um, but not with, um, not with the traditional surrogacy. And one of the reasons why I think traditional surrogacy went out the window is because we had the Baby Evelyn case. Now, I'm not sure if anyone's spoken about the Baby, Baby Evelyn case already, clearly, but certainly that was a, a situation in this country which frightened a lot of people because it, it went badly. And um, having um, it went through the courts, went through um, both the initial court and then the appeals court, and um, the result of it all was that the baby Evelyn, as she was called, was eventually um, located with the surrogate mother and, um, and not with the conditioning mother. And that was a very difficult case and it sort of informed people in some ways and they thought, well, we don't want to leave it that guy. So that what's happened in this country, at least, is that we, we do gestational surrogacy and that seems to be um, comparatively trouble free. Um, certainly we have no court case like the baby Evelyn one, which was so distressing, I'm sure, for a number of people. Um, I'm also going to be talking about altruistic surrogacy. I mean, you've heard from Kim earlier about uh, commercial surrogacy. It doesn't exist in this country, and um, it's, it's always interesting to speculate about why that is. Um, I'm not sure if I've got all the answers to it either, but I think that one of the reasons why Australians go for altruistic surrogacy is that there's been a long history of volunteerism in this country, where people um, put themselves out to do something for other people and don't expect necessarily any reward for it. In other countries, the commercial incentive seems to be much more part of the culture, 
And I'm not saying that we don't have a commercial culture in this country in some parts. I'm sure you're aware of that. But it's, when it comes to this, uh, to this level of, um, uh, of our lives, it seems that um, to be able to volunteer and to do something altruistically um, has a higher moral um, status. And so that's what we do. And whether that will change in the, in the future is another matter and probably another argument. But that's why it is. Um, now, some of these uh, uh, items that I've got here, these dot points, really refer to what's in our legislation in Victoria. So these are, these are, this is what the legislation actually tells us we have to, we have to do. Um, so firstly, um, people seeking surrogacy have to, have to satisfy doctors that they're unlikely to become pregnant. They also um, have to um, also be good. Well, another, another part of it is that their, their life or health or that of any baby, which I haven't put on that particular dot point, would be endangered by a pregnancy or birth. So, and some of the more common reasons are the ones that I've listed here, congenital absence of the uterus, abnormalities and so on. Now, so in, without going through them all, you can read them, but, but in general, the, 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 the general statement about all of that is that these um, women have very difficult medical history. There's, there's a... There's a a level at which they have been very distressed and disturbed by the sorts of things that have happened to them. And so when they come to this stage of things, um, it's not just a matter of going through a surrogacy treatment, you're also dealing with the fact that they've had a very difficult and distressing medical history. And that's um, almost universal in, in all of the couples that I've seen. So who does it? Um, they're, they're the people who, who normally go through this. These are the people who are altruistically volunteering, offering um, their, their services to their wife, their sister, sister-in-law, and so on. The, there have been one or two mothers who offered, which might be interesting for you to think about that for a minute. Um, the situation that I, I can remember at least twice when this has happened has been where a young woman has been um, born with a congenital absent uh, uterus. That was known very early in the piece, so as a teenager she was uh, diagnosed, and at the time both the mothers that I can think of right now said to them, uh, don't worry, I'll do it for you, I'll have the baby for you when you're older. So that was always part of the family plan, if you like, that in that, that particular, in those families, um, that's how it worked. So um, in one case it was successful, I know, and in one case it was not. The, um, the important part about it is that at least the, the patient review panel in Victoria who has to consider all these things, and perhaps I'll say a bit more about that later, um, they, take, they take seriously that there's been an ongoing relationship. So they like, they like to think that yes, the people that are involved in this, the couples that are involved, um, have known each other for some time, they've got, a, they've got some kind of significant relationship that they can point to, and uh, if that's not the case, then it's... <coughs> It's not that they would necessarily reject an application, but they would certainly not see it quite so favourably. Advertising for a surrogate in, in, uh, this, in Victoria is illegal. So it's a tricky one, that, because um, uh, I'm quite sure that um, behind the scenes, something close to that might go on. Um, but certainly, um, if it was in some way made public, it would not be approved by the patient review panel and there would be penalties applied to it. So what has to happen, of course, is that people who are wanting to do this have to make it known that they might be interested in somebody offering them um, the possibility of um, being a surrogate. So that makes it all a little complex and it makes some relationships a bit difficult. But nevertheless, it's, it's the way it has to be. And in fact, in most of the cases that I have seen, um, the offer is in fact quite genuine. I mean, it's often the case that um, that the, the commissioning couple will be quite surprised. And I, in fact, I can think of an example just uh, about 10 days ago where a couple came in and um, we, we began the, 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 uh, the conversations around this and they disclosed that, um, that when they were, they were all sitting down together, this family group, and uh, it just looked like it was going to be one of those family dinners that we all have. And, um, and this um, uh, woman's sister said, uh, look, we, we've decided that we'll make an offer for you to, I'm prepared to be a surrogate for you. I know that it's been a difficulty in your life. And that came out of the blue. The, the commissioning parents, as they became, weren't expecting that. It, was, it wasn't something that they had thought would happen. And 
uh, and in fact it was actually offered by one of the sisters to this woman who was in some ways the least expected one. There was another sister who might have been perhaps more likely by the thought to have done it, but no. And so it was a surprise. Um, material benefit to the surrogate mother in this country is illegal. That's the whole commercial thing. And what becomes rather difficult sometimes is what sorts of costs therefore are okay. And the legislation uh, makes it clear that prescribed costs, which are directly incurred, and that's, uh, they're the actual phrases or words from the legislation, is okay. So medical expenses and so on, that's, all of that's fine. Um, what's not quite clear is something like um, uh, loss of income or expenses for having to have the, the house cleaned, for example, because towards the end of the pregnancy, the surrogate mum is just too tired to do all the things that she ordinarily would do. And so, so those sorts of issues come up and they haven't been tested in any of the in, in court. Uh, they're not mentioned in the legislation directly, and so I think what mostly happens, if I could guess at what some of the people I know are doing, is that they're probably making their own arrangements around that. Um, these, uh, these are the conditions for offering to be a surrogate in, in Victoria. Um, you have to be over 25, you have to have had a pregnancy and given birth to a live child, and you can't use your own overall when we set that. Counselling is mandatory, and that usually happens in, in this state in the, the, uh, the clinics, and there are really three clinics really that are doing this now in, in Victoria. Um, for a long time it wasn't possible in Victoria, well, well it was, but the legislation was so complicated and so uh, strange, people thought it was illegal. It was never illegal, it was just difficult. Yeah, I mean, what had to happen was the surrogate had to be infertile and so did her husband. Well, you know, think about that for a minute. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so, anyway, they managed to straighten out the legislation, but it's, it means anyway, the counselling is, is mandatory, um, legal consultation is mandatory, and the bit that I do is the independent psychological assessment. It's not actually mandatory, it's not written in the legislation, but the clinics require it. And I think they require it for um, a good reason. I think that it's part of the screening process. It's uh, you've heard Kim talk a little bit about earlier, and I'll say a bit more about it if I get a moment later. But it's um, but it's part of what um, what what is done with uh, with any of the clinics. And in fact, some of my early experience when it was so difficult to do this in Victoria was with the clinic that Martin was associated with in Canberra, and also um, what the Sydney IVF, which now has another name in there. And so a lot of Victorian couples were traipsing in the state at great expense to to do all this stuff another place and um, now they don't have to go quite so far. Um, there's a whole checking system which is written into our legislation here, the criminal records check um, of, of everybody. I think I'll, I'll say there is the intending surrogate mother and apartment but also the commission couple have to undergo this as well. So everybody gets checked um, and um, in, in, in particular what the patient review panel are looking for because they haven't look at all this material is whether there are um, offences of a sexual violent nature. And um, we've had and some couples go through where there has been a bit of history of criminal behaviour, some of it not terribly significant, like a little bit of marijuana at the age of 18, well, that doesn't seem to bother the patient review that don't so much. But, um, but certainly if there was uh, something more serious and violent, that would be a problem. The other issue is, is undertaking a uh, child protection check so that if people have ever had a child removed from their guardianship, that's, uh, that's likely to stop the whole thing. So um, those checks are done routinely now and um, um, some people believe that, uh, of course, this is somewhat uh, uh, over-screened because we don't do these sorts of things to other people who have had children. But um, nevertheless, I think the reason that these things are done is because there's some sense that uh, there's a lot of investment of public expenditure in the, in the whole treatment process and um, therefore we need to be in some way more careful about these than we do for other people. Now whether, whether you agree with that or not, that's another matter, but that's the sort of issue that comes up. These are the prescribed matters for counselling in Victoria and these are the things that um, my colleagues and I have to go through. My colleagues in the clinics will take people through these sorts of things. So these are, the, these are the issues that are thought to be important for um, people approaching surrogacy. The implications of, uh, of, 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 of the, the surrogacy treatment for the relationship is obviously the first one. So they want everybody to at least be aware of what's happening and 
by everybody, they mean not just the four people or whatever, maybe two people who are going through the, 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 the treatment process, but also the extended families. It's not always the case that extended families are all that supportive of this. Uh, most of the time they are, but not always. And um, yet it's something that has to be has to be addressed. So that if there are difficulties with extended families, then it's, it's part of the whole process is to work out ways in which uh, people might actually deal with some of that. Uh, the possibility of medical complications is meant to be addressed. Um, the possibility of people changing their minds. Um, this doesn't happen very often. Um, in fact, uh, in, in all the time that I've, I've seen uh, people, um, a change of mind is only, if I can, I've tried to think of this before when Kim was speaking, I think I can only remember about two of those. And, um, and they happened fairly early in the, in the, in the piece. So that it didn't, in, in the end, extend to any great difficulty later on. And it's certainly much better if you're going to change your mind to do it early. Um, but uh, people are concerned about it, and the patient review panel wants to know that people are very uh, able to be clear and um, well informed about their decision, and not likely, therefore, to change their mind. Uh, the attitude of all the parties regarding the conduct of the pregnancy, that, that refers to things like uh, the, the level of um, medical, um, uh, I suppose, investigation that's going to go on through the pregnancy. Is everyone in agreement about all of that? Uh, they're also concerned with, I think, the, the kind of uh, lifestyle differences that there may be between the person who's the surrogate and the commissioned couple. Is there, is there some disagreement about that? I mean, a, a very obvious one would be if the surrogate wants to insist on continuing to smoke. Is that going to be okay with the uh, commissioned couple? Now, Luckily, we don't have too much of that anymore. Most people seem to have got a message about that. But nevertheless, it's an example of the sort of thing that could be, could be um, difficult. Perhaps the use of alcohol might be another one that might be perhaps uh, more likely to disturb people if there were serious differences about what was going on. Um, the attitude of people to the investigation for genetic abnormality. And of course, the issue for that is that the, um, the couple who are offering to be a surrogate or the woman who is doing it anyway, it's her body, and, um, and she still has control over what goes on with it, and despite the fact that, of course, she's offering to do this thing for somebody else. So there needs to be some agreement about that. And I must say that most couples, when they arrive to see me, have actually given this a fair bit of thought. It's one of the issues that they seem to have, in their own research, come to, come to terms with, and they've usually got it sorted out. Every now and again, it's not been addressed, and that becomes an important thing, therefore, for people to have to decide about. Um, and um, I have to say that most of the time, it does seem that the surrogates will say, look, I, I volunteered to do this. This was an altruistic gesture on my part. If, um, if my sister, sister-in-law, or whoever it is, wants to um, uh, have various checkups for, say, Down syndrome, and there's going to be a termination as a result of whatever they find, I'm OK with that. So it seems to be that that's part of the, the um, considerations that they've had um, before they've actually um, made the offer. How am I going? Still all right? You're good. You're good. <coughs> um, okay, some of the other matters we've got to do. We've, it, because you can't predict quite what's going to happen, nobody really knows how it's going to work out and what sorts of stresses and, in, in, and incidents are going to occur through the treatment process. Uh, it's important that people have worked out to how to negotiate with each other so that there is, if there is any sort of difficulty with some of the treatment, that people can sit down and be fairly frank with each other and, and discuss it and sort out what they want to do. Um, it seems to be, for me anyway, one of the most important things to do. I can't predict all of the things that are going to happen and neither can any of the people that I talk with. We just don't know sometimes what, what, what life has ahead. But if you've got good dispute resolution skills, and I think that that's the important thing, can then address some of the issues that, that do come up. Um, the process for the care of a child, when should, should one of the commissioning parents die, well that needs to be part of what people think about and they have to, uh, in, in this case they would need to uh, speak with the lawyers about this and, uh, and get something in place, like in their wills for example, about what they're going to do. Um, there's an interesting question about the legal um, position with some of the clinics in Victoria in that um, so some of them insist that the commissioning couple and the surrogate couple actually have different lawyers. And I think the reason for that is because they think, well, 
um, they need to get their own independent advice about what to do. Um, I'm not, I must say I'm not sure that that's actually the best thing to do. Uh, my own sense of it is that um, at, the, at the stage that people are when they're approaching surrogacy, not they haven't gone through it yet, they're just trying to find out what the implications are. I, I'm not sure that it wouldn't be better to see the same word. I mean, I don't know why we have to um, artificially divide people when they're just at the stage when they're, they're actually in a very trusting relationship and they're actually trying to do something together and quite collaboratively. Why you want to send them off to the employers? But um, I mean, if, if anything did go wrong and there was an issue later on, there's nothing to stop somebody going to another legal firm and saying, hey, "I'm sorry, I need to get some independent advice here." That can always happen, but that's what goes on. But um, I'm just not sure that that's the way it should go. But however, that's just a personal opinion, and there may be different opinions in the audience. Um, attitudes towards the ongoing relationship between the surrogate mother, her family and the child. So in other words, what, what's going to be the nature of the relationships in the future? And we can't really predict it all that well, but it's nice to think that people have given it some thought that they, what, have, what are they going to be in the future? Are they going to be a special friend of the child or, or a favourite aunt or whatever it is? Um, but they need to have thought about that to some extent that it's not necessarily just going to be something where uh, there's no more, no more contact. For most of the people that I see, at least, because they're in family relationships, it is going to be, they are going to see each other in um, lots of family functions and, um, and what, therefore, is going to be the way in which they will relate to each other. Have they thought through what that relationship will be? And there's a whole lot of other things that can come up in the counselling sessions which have to, be, have to be addressed. And I suppose the most obvious one, in some ways, is... Um, uh, is, is there any tension in any way between any of the couples, um, uh, in particular relationship tensions between people? Um, and, and the ones, in the cases that I have had to um, make negative uh, assessments of people, it's, it's been in relation to that. And um, it's not, um, I must say, it's not, it sounds like a difficult thing to do, um, but in fact it's not, because I suppose my approach to it is that if I sense that um, as a result of the screening that I'm doing, and I do use a psychological test as well as my own observations and interviews and so on to do these things, um, if I sense that there's a, 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 a tension there for some reason and there's some difference of opinion about something, we talk about it. It has to be worked out. And I can remember um, on several occasions saying to people, well, look, I think you know, until you get this clear, we better put this on hold. And, and that's exactly what happens, so that people then have time to perhaps think through whatever it is that's the issue. Um, and in some cases, resolved in a way which enables them to continue. Um, some of the other issues um, in, in Victoria, anyway, with surrogacy agreements are now okay. They weren't for one, they weren't for a while, but now they are. And uh, some people like to draw up formal agreements. Some people work, keep it informal. Um, it's, it's, it seems to me that they're interesting things to do because at least they, they are statements whereby people can, can remember at least what they agreed to do. Oh yes, we thought we would agree to do this or so on. I think that's, I think that's important. Um, relinquishment and acceptance. I'll say something a little bit more about that in a minute because that's, that's something that the patient review panel is really important. The really experience is very important. Uh, I've talked about the relationship really. So one of the issues with um, working with family groups is is there any coercion? That's, the patient review panel really doesn't want to think that that's happening. And I mean, you, you, you can all uh, understand that perhaps if an older sister, for example, is infertile, you know, for whatever reason, can't have her own pregnancies, is, is there any coercion on the younger sister to do it for her? Uh, that, that, that is the issue which I think people struggle with sometimes. And I think well, that, it would be so easy for that to be the case. And it's part of the reason why we have to have the screen. Um, the next point I think we've already been through, and I think um, we've heard uh, Kim talk about that, so I won't bother with too much of that. But um, I think managing the responses of others, what I call facing the crowd, is, is an issue that some people have to really think long about. So sometimes people are about this sort of issue uh, wanting to be a bit more private about it, but of course this is one thing you simply cannot be private about. I mean, the, the, the woman at the checkout at the supermarket will know exactly what's going on and you have to have some way of dealing with those sorts of issues and talking about what's going on in some way. So managing those issues is important. These are some of the other things that have come up. Um, 
having a birth plan, what, what, what's going to happen when the baby's actually being delivered on the day that the baby's born? Who's going to be there? Um, is everybody there for the football team or the whole extended family or is it just going to be you know, something a bit more private? It's whatever it is, and I've heard both, um, it, it needs to be something that everyone agrees on. The next point is one that I think is absolutely critical and, and it's about how long is the surrogate and her partner how, how long are they going to make this offer available for? Um, it, it, it needs to be negotiated and it needs to be very clear because there's a possibility of really some quite serious um, misunderstanding if you get this wrong. If the couple, who are, the commissioning couple, they want it to go on a bit or they, you know, have, there hasn't been success the first or second time or whatever, they want to um, uh, let it go for another six months or whatever. And, uh, Sorry, the couple on the other hand is thinking, I've been in this for a year now, I think it's time for me to do something else. Whatever that is, you can imagine that there could be conflict over that, it needs to be sorted out. Um, in Victoria, you need to get parentage orders, which you have to wait 28 days and then apply and then do it before it's six months. And in that case, the uh, uh, commissioning parents' names go on the birth certificate. Um, there's also the issue of uh, what happens if the whole thing fails. And this is actually something that sometimes people haven't thought about. Because they're so caught up with the, sort of the whole altruism of it all. I'm doing this wonderful thing for my sister, and that's fine and I want to do it. But they haven't really thought sometimes seriously about the fact that it might not work. And you can imagine that, uh, that that's that difficult. If you've, if you've got to a point where you've really made what many of us would be almost the most important offer you could ever make to, it, to somebody else, um, what are you going to do if it doesn't work? Where did your altruism go then? So that's a, that's a difficult one and one that needs to be sorted through. Yeah. Two minutes, Roger. Two minutes. Okay, I might just, what I want to do is just say a couple of minutes about the research because part of what I do or have done at the university, I've had several students that I've managed to convince to, to do some work in all of this. And just to be very brief about it, um, uh, we've done research with the commission couples, with the surrogates, with the surrogates' partners. Um, with the assessment process, which is really what I was doing, and also with some, um, the last study was, which has just been published, which was in relation to attitudes to surrogates in Australia. So though that, that's, uh, these, these research projects were uh, qualitative studies. Um, the one on commissioning couples was about, was 18 commissioning couples that were in that. And um, in some ways, uh, I think the most important um, the most important uh, study of the whole of the five in a way was probably the ones on the one on the surrogate mothers. Because the, the thing that really gets people, I think, is is, is the surrogate mother going to be uh, psychologically attached to this baby so that she can't give it up? And um, that there's a whole bonding thing that goes on during pregnancy and, and women who are mothers will say, look, oh, I don't know, this is, I, I got so attached to my, my baby before he was, she was born. And I, 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 couldn't, I couldn't do this. Actually, the answer to that is, well, you don't have to. It's not compulsory. And which I say to the surrogate um, couples. But um, the, the, the issue is, for, for the surrogates, what, what is almost uh, it's a universal sort of um, cognitive position that they take is that this is not my baby. This baby belongs, it's the, it's the sperm and egg of my sister and brother-in-law or whoever it is. It's not mine. The DNA that I'm carrying is not mine. I'm like an early incubator. I'm just looking after this for a while, and I've, I'm able to do it, and I will do it. And I'm quite convinced that, that uh, when the time comes, that this is not going to be an issue. Anymore. Now, that, that's the voice of, of, of the surrogates. Who's, that, that's what they say. Um, it sometimes doesn't convince people who are not really convinced about this, or whose minds it's difficult to change. But that's what they say. I should finish, and perhaps it's a, a little bit of time for questions. Not after the next one. Okay, that was just some quotations. I'll leave all those. Um, this is probably not quite so important. There's, there's just the issue of relinquishment, which is what I just said, and there's the issue of acceptance. The patient review panel really wants relinquishment and acceptance to be very clear. <coughs> it's a big question I have to put into reports that I write and so on. Is the surrogate going to relinquish? Is the uh, commissioning couple going to accept? And Basically, the answer is yes, they do, and they say those things, and, and to my knowledge, um, there has been uh, no difficulty with that so far. 
Okay. That's just a little slide. I'll leave up while I answer some questions. Right, uh, time for just a couple of quick questions up the back. Just a comment. Yeah. Uh, speaking as a lawyer, yes. the reason that two lawyers are required in the process is twofold. First, we have a duty to our clients, which means we've got a fiduciary duty. If we breach that, <coughs> then we can get sued. And the second related uh, one to that is that it's a breach of professional indemnity insurance rules if we act for both sides. So we can only act for one side. What I see as being critical in the, in the process is to have two lawyers who actually know what they're doing, uh, and that can be very rare with surrogacy, and secondly, that they have a collaborative approach. Kim was talking before about having this team approach, collaborative approach, that's essential. Because it's very easy for lawyers, surprise, surprise, to have, to create arguments. Yes. And a lot harder for lawyers to work as a team whilst representing their client and making sure that things go smoothly. That's, that's what I'm okay, well, I'm a psychologist, so I'll, I'll defer to you. <laughs> okay, we need to move on, Roger. Thank you very much.